um, how, so uh, firstly um, I really enjoyed the movie it's a shame obviously I didn't get to see it on the big screen but that's quite difficult at the moment <laughs> um, but I thought it was really great um, I haven't got too long so I'm gonna get sort of started um, yeah, just gonna be just ask really. I mean, just where this idea sort of originally came from was it? Was it one that's been with you for quite a while? Or yeah, well, it, as is often the way of these things, um, you know, you have the idea and you write a, a rough draft, and then you know a year goes by and then you write another draft. Because quite early on, uh, I had producers involved. Um, I I I knew quite clearly that I wanted to make a film. Um, this. Uh, it can be a bit tricky to describe because I don't know how you work and, and everybody works differently and some people you know they'll find a situation or a character and that will spark something and then it'll grow from there and I tend to work from the outside in I tend to work from kind of very abstract ideas into something tangible so I knew I wanted to make a story that was going to have that kind of dreamlike quality to it and um, I knew I wanted to make a story that would have a really powerful narrative engine and um, and that would also contain within it I hope ideas that are worth thinking about and exploring because that's that's the kind of cinema that I love and mm. um, so I wanted to make a thriller with a sci-fi element that used all the artillery of cinema you know image and sound and uh, character and propulsive story and um, to ask what might be interesting questions that we that we need to tease out or that are kind of sore spots culturally um, and uh, one of the things that I knew I wanted to do really early on was um, I, I, started, um, I started thinking about the fact that we have a very odd relationship with the scientific method in the West, culturally. We tend to, in our popular culture, position scientists in this odd position of being somehow unethical or disconnected from, you know, truthful human emotions. And it goes back to Frankenstein, but you see it a lot. In, in modern kind of grounded sci-fi, you know, this idea of the scientist who, who wants to reach beyond what is somehow ethical or doesn't understand the ethical consequences of what they're doing. And it strikes me as um, misleading and untruthful uh, and potentially damaging and dangerous for us culturally. You know, it's, it's the kind of thing that leads to, leads to um, do you remember Michael Gove in 2016 saying we've had enough of experts? You know, there's a kind of, um, uh, anti-intellectual quality to that, that that I find really disturbing because one of the things that I think is you know if you talk about what are the great successes that we as a species have uh, what are the great let's put it differently what are the great successes that we culturally have achieved you could go industrial revolution vaccines whatever but actually all of those things are kind of rooted in the scientific method um, and the scientific method is the thing that has transformed us as a species you know, that allows us to live longer, to recover from our injuries, to vaccinate our children, to um, create the kind of technologies that allow you and I to talk right now, right? Uh, so I wanted to tell a story with a scientist hero. Um, and when I looked at the kind of sci-fi films that, um, that I loved, a lot of the times the, the scientist is either the antagonist or the unfeeling character. And so I wanted a scientist hero. But at the same time, I kind of wanted to investigate, well, where do those, cliches where does that cultural trope of popular cinema come from the trope being the cold-hearted isolated scientist that is unable to communicate with people around them and I started investigating um, neurodiversity and this idea of um, uh, you know people who maybe uh, are cognitively a bit different and struggle to communicate struggle to um, to make social connections in a, in a more traditional way and those people are often drawn to the sciences because the sciences is, is one area of endeavor where even if you're a little bit socially deaf or you're a little bit socially unable, it, it's not going to hinder you in terms of your ability to contribute. Um, and I started wondering whether that cliche trope of the scientist might be rooted in um, you know, scientific figures like Cavendish, who may possibly have been neurodivergent. Uh, and that's why I decided to, to make this character somebody who perhaps at the outset appears to be embodying a trope of the genre and then what I hope is that I reframe that trope going but truthfully what is it that's going on here truthfully you know who might that person really be uh, and to articulate her as somebody who yes she struggles to communicate and yes she struggles to make bonds with other people but if you were in a crisis if you were hanging off the edge of a cliff 
Jesus Christ, she is the person you would want at the other end of the rope because she would never let go. Mm. No, it's fascinating you say that because I've never really thought about that. But you're right, the scientist is almost like the, in, in movies, the annoying voice of reason. So you have the kind of renegade hero that will go, and the scientist will say, don't do this. But the hero is adamant if they do it their way, they'll, and then they often, often usually go on to succeed, sort of proving that. Yeah, yeah. It, or the it, scientist yeah. is a villain who's, who's, yeah. who's uh, generating some sort of experiment or some new event that is actually threatening and unethical. Yeah. You know, that's often the trope, the Frankenstein trope, essentially. Mm. Okay, yeah, because I mean, you, you, I mentioned too about the kind of the the the, the, the boring, the kind of sci-fi elements, and there's kind of thriller elements, and there's a horror. I mean, this is one of those films that seamlessly moves between genres and is impossible to to kind of define. Which I mean that as a compliment, by the way. But do you think there's an inclination in this industry to always have to label films? Do you think because well, I imagine this is one of those films when you're trying to get funding and stuff, you've got to condense into a one-line sentence. Was that quite a challenge for you? And does it frustrate you that films can be condensed into such short sentences in, in a bid to kind of generate sort of money and, and publicity? It's an interesting question, isn't it? It's, you know, what kind of stories do we want? And I would argue that actually, we, you know, the kind of stories that I want um, are, are stories that, uh, that have that quality, that are unexpected, uh, and that are that have a quality of um, of you know the archetype, but that will take you in unexpected directions. I guess that's that's the sort of thing that I love. So the films that um you know that uh, that I was thinking of in relation to this project were that kind of grounded sci-fi, um films like Arrival or Annihilation, um where there's a groundedness and a truthfulness um to the storytelling, uh, and where particularly you know a film like uh, like Arrival where there's genuine um character uh, richness of character and uh, and a richness of kind of underlying themes um, but one of the things that I did want to try and do is exactly what you're saying which is to very conscious and I'm very aware that you know as viewers who who like thrillers and and who like um, sci-fi and who like horror that uh, we're all very educated about um, how these stories should work and in a way what I wanted to do was to quote some of that, uh, quote some of those genre tropes and reframe them and transform them and go, here's a trope of the genre, but we're going to change it. We're going to make it into something different and we're going to give it a different emotional pull and a different narrative pull so that we're kind of tipping our hat and acknowledging that this is a very kind of rich theme, but we're also trying to reframe some of those things that have become uh, or not even that have become, that are uh, somewhat cliches of the genre. And often that's to do with representation. It's to do with representation of women, representation of people of color, um, and to, to kind of reframe those representations and reframe those, those quotations with a different meaning. And just to, to go back, I'm just thinking about the, 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 the lead character being a scientist. Um, one of the things I found quite interesting, which is an interesting trope, was that um, she's a scientist, but she doesn't have the answers to everything. Now, usually in some movies, we put all of our sort of dependability on the protagonist and, and they'll steer us in the right direction. But what was quite interesting about this was she didn't have the answers to everything because some things are unexplained. And I was just wondering about yourself writing that. I think there's a, um, so maybe a misconception that we always believe the author to, to be all knowing, to have the answers to everything. But I guess even in this instance, there were some things even you yourself didn't have the answers to. Well, there are, there are two things there. There's, um, first of all, what I wanted to do was with the, with the kind of discovery aspect of it, with the animal aspect of it, um, not to be too pat, not to be too play, cliche about that, um, and rather to leave that a very open question going, you know, there's bottom trawling happening, uh, which is obviously illegal and incredibly damaging to the biosphere. So the suggestion is there in the narrative that, you know, it's, it's because of damage to the biosphere that this thing has come up from the depths. Um, and that it's, uh, you know, it's the drive for uh, the economic frailty of the people involved that has driven them to this kind of ecological risk. Uh, and it's that um, uh, kind of trying to balance between ecological disaster and economic disasters that the people in the story are constantly fighting with. Um, so I wanted to say, okay, so this animal's being drawn up because the biosphere is being damaged and we don't really understand the biosphere. So when we damage it, we're not quite sure what we're doing or what kind of unintended consequences might come up from that. But at the same time, once that was in place in the story, I didn't want to go too much further because you can't start saying um, life happens, well, why? You know, there is no why. There is no kind of broader metaphysical why. It just is, life just is. 
uh, you know, why is a worm? <laughs> that it, that it, you, you, ha you have to kind of just accept that and go, there may not ever be an answer to that, life just is. Um, and our duty and our responsibility is to see ourselves as a dynamic part of a broader biosphere and that we have a responsibility to every other living form um, that we're no better and no worse and we're not in charge in that sense, that everything has an equal right to exist. Um, but the other side of that was um, that idea about the, the scientists being all-knowing. One of the producers on the project, actually, while I was writing it, well, uh, one of the drafts went, no, 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 you have to rewrite that because she has to know. She's saying, I don't know too much. She must know. She must know. She must have the answers. That's how this story works. And I, and I had to fight that quite profoundly going, that is the opposite of what I'm writing here. We're, like if we're making, if I'm making a story that's about the scientific method, one of the fundamental principles is the acknowledgement of I do not know. Isn't this the point? Is to is is it's the opposite of magical thinking in that, you know, we have certain leaders around the world going, well, I know, I know better than anybody else. I've known all of them, pretending that they know things or trying to trick you into thinking that they know things, when actually the most important thing that we can do as people is to go. I may be wrong, I may be wrong, and I will look at the evidence and evaluate it and make the best judgment that I can in that moment, and I am always willing to revise that judgment. And that's the essence of the scientific method. So for me as a character, she had to do that. She had to do that. She had to be wrong. <laughs> also, I, I just, I, I, I loved it as well because she had to be nuanced because I think one of the things, and I'm not sure if this is maybe a social media thing, but it feels like everything nowadays is just so black and white. You have to be, you have to say, you have to be on one stance or the other, never really in between the two. And yeah. sometimes there's no, there's no, there's no shame in saying sometimes I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that the, I think it's Oscar Wilde, is it, who says uh, the mark of true intelligence is cognitive dissonance, is to be able to hold two opposing views in your head at the same time and see the merits of both of them. Um, and uh, I really strongly agree with you. You know, we don't always have to nail our colours. <laughs> it's all right to change no. your mind. In fact, it's a sign of you're actually thinking. I know. But um, it just reminds me of a chat I had with a filmmaker, a Hungarian filmmaker called Laszlo Nemes, which I think I've said his name right. Um, and he said that, um, and it just always stuck with me, he said his characters keep secrets from him. And I was just wondering if that's something you agree with, if, if, if that's even as when you create a character and you write the character, do they sometimes have a life of their own and they, will they think things and do things that maybe even you aren't aware of, if that makes sense? <laughs> I, think, I think that's a really interesting question. I think, um, you know, I think, Stefan, we all contain multitudes, right? We all contain lots of different impulses and ideas and feelings and you know, characters are not people. Um, uh, I forget who it was, there's some great novelist who said, you know, if my character spoke back to me, I would kill them immediately. Um, <laughs> that, um, that they're not people, that, that storytelling is different. Um, but at the same time, what, what you do or what I do when we sit down to write is you try to be as truthful as you can. So you inhabit the character as much as you can. And when you do that, I think that does happen, doesn't it? It does happen that you go, well, of course, this character, you know, she, she comes from this uh, environment, so her, her impulse is going to be in this direction. Uh, and that can surprise you when you're kind of inhabiting it and driving the car through the story as that character, that, that her impulse is taking you in a direction you didn't anticipate. Um, but I, 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 I suspect that's the same thing. I suspect the other um, filmmakers saying it in a much more magical and, and poetic way. <laughs> Um, but we're, we're, we're talking about magic, maybe not the right word, but superstition is very much a big uh, factor. And there's obviously the character have, being a redhead is something. And she walks on the boat and instantly the other characters see that as being sort of bad luck. I'm just wondering about the, the world of superstition in, 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 well, in that world, in that environment, out at sea. Is that something you had to research into? And secondly, the second part of the question is, uh, have you got any superstitions yourself? <laughs> Um, the world of superstition is really interesting. You know, once I knew that I wanted to make a story about the scientific method and have a, have a scientist hero and somebody who goes, I don't know, uh, then you go, okay, well, what's the logical opposition to that? What's, what's the opposite of that? And the opposite of that is magical thinking, right? The opposite of that is, I don't know, but I feel, I feel this to be true. And uh, when I was doing research into that, there were a couple of really interesting things that came up. The first thing is, um, we all kind of have to indulge in magical thinking in order to be emotionally and psychologically healthy. 
you know, we all have a kind of artificially uh, positive view of what's coming next for us. <laughs> because if we didn't, it would be really depressing, right? <laughs> so we all kind of bob around in this very optimistic view of the future that's not actually really quite accurate and not really reflected by our past. But we do it anyway. And that's the kind of magical thinking. And in situations like this, apparently, this is, a, I'm really nerdy, so I did a whole load of research into this. Situations like this where you and I haven't met, we do a bit of magical thinking. I go, I, I bet I know what that sounds like. I bet we're going to go, I bet this is going to go great. Yeah. And, you know, we have no rationale for that. It's just magical thinking. It's just yeah. like, I bet I can imagine what you're thinking and you bet you can imagine what I'm thinking. And so we make friends and that's how friendship works. Yeah. And um, it's this kind of leap of faith. So what I wanted to do was, um, was look at how stories really sustain us and support us and how mythology and, um, and magical thinking really supports us and sustains us. And so that's why, you know, the, the two central, uh, the two people who run the boat, who have this really very difficult life where they're trying to do their best by the people that they're responsible for um, at the same time as trying to live ethical lives, that, um, you know, they have this grief in their own past of having lost a child. And one of the ways that Freya manages that is through magical thinking, through imagining that um, that her child is with her, uh, and that you know this the mythology of Neve Kinor and the water somehow supports her and buoys up her emotional feelings about her child. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that kind of magical thinking if it sustains you and it keeps you whole and it allows you to move forward. And so I wanted to have that really powerfully in the story, going there is nothing wrong with this. The other thing that I discovered about superstition is, of course, and you know, once you think about it, you go, shit, of course. Fishing is one of those industries where, the, at, the, at the scale that these people are doing it, which is these kind of small boats, you know, family-like boats where they sleep seven and that's it. It's really out of your control what's going to happen. You know, the weather is outside of your control, where the shows are is outside of your control. You have very little control, so you take this huge risk every time you go out. Um, and those people risk life and limb to get a fish onto our table with no control. And, and what happens to us as humans when we have no control is we try to exert control to make it feel safer for ourselves. And the way we do that is things like, you know, throwing salt over our shoulder or knocking on the table three times or whatever just makes us feel like we control something when there's no control. So I think that's why that community in particular is so superstitious is because they're in a business that has so little control and so you have to try and find your find your security somehow. The thing about redheads is really interesting though. I don't know if this is true, um, but I have been told by a folklorist that nobody quite knows where the origin of the uh, redheads on boats comes from, but there is a theory that it dates back to the Viking era. Because, as you know, all around the eastern seaboard and the western seaboard of Ireland, the Vikings are coming down during uh, the pre-Renaissance uh, and sacking all of the monasteries and sacking all of the towns. Um, and people think of Irish people as redheads, but actually uh, red hair is quite rare in Ireland. Um, but the place where it's, it's a gene that's associated with blondes, so the place where you get most redheads is Scandinavia. Mm. Um, and so the theory runs, if you see a redhead on a boat, we're all screwed. <laughs> it's the Vikings in their longboats coming to rape and pillage the village. <laughs> well, I still uh, when I and that that's the, where the, the yeah. superstition comes from. Because I was gonna say, well, I still when I play football, I always touch the the grass when I walk onto the pitch, thinking it's going to be good luck. But I still play badly almost every time, so it's still not doing anything for me. Um, you never know. You never know. Maybe yeah. you're playing better than you would if you didn't touch that's the grass. We've <laughs> um, actually run out of time. Uh, I know because Marek said that your next one starts at two, so I better say goodbye unfortunately but uh, thank you so much for your time today um oh listen um, thank you it was a pleasure yeah. talking to you yeah, and hopefully by the next one we might be able to actually do this in person who knows <laughs> yeah well here's hoping let's let's knock on wood for that okay but anyway, thanks so much take care ladies and gentlemen you're watching hey you guys hey you guys huh hey, you guys, is yeah. that from the goonies it is indeed, yeah. nice hey you